we all know the Furalisa tune. The da -da 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 -da. One of the tunes which is probably the most popular of Beethoven's tunes ever for us today was written by him for a female friend as a personal token of love. He's 38 years old. Uh, isn't it time he got married? So he's looking for a wife. He asked a friend to try and find him a wife. Therese Malfatti is one of these women apparently Ludwig typically falls in love with. He is her piano teacher. He feels comfortable in her family, which is a noble family. He asked for some new clothes, he asked for a mirror to check, check. he wants some new, new, new shirts, new ties. So he's looking, he's looking to smarten his appearance. In 1810, he actually wanted to marry her. And when he was turned down and he heard that, he was really devastated. Your news has again plunged me from the heights of the most sublime ecstasy down into the depths. Am I then nothing more than a music maker for yourself and the others? Beethoven looks for love over and over in unavailable women, and some have proposed that unconsciously he is going after women he knows are not available because he's protecting himself and his art and so forth and so on. I don't believe that. I think that he just never quite got the message. Beethoven's day-to-day, -day, everyday life was so kind of hectic and dysfunctional in many ways. He was able to create the life he wanted in his music because it has love, passion, tears, embraces, everything is there. I thank all those women who rejected him because he put all that passion into the music. In one of his rare flashes of self-understanding, Beethoven writes to a publisher at one point, everything I do outside music is badly done and stupid. June 1803, Beethoven is 32 years old. The heat and the dust were wretched in Vienna, so he always went somewhere in the summer. He arrives in Oberdürbling, just up the hill from Heiligenstadt, where the autumn before he had written the cry from the cross, which we call the Heiligenstadt Testament. It's also a kind of a suicide note in which he basically saw for the first time clearly what his life was going to be, both in terms of what he was attempting to achieve and what he was going to have to contend with. His hearing was going to get worse. His health, which involved painful digestive problems, that's not going to get better. He turns at one point defiant and he says, I can't imagine killing myself when I'm haven't done what I know I can do yet. And in June 1803, he writes the Eroica Symphony. He writes it remarkably fast. He wrote it in about three months. But now, it wasn't called the Eroica yet. When he conceived it, it was very importantly called Bonaparte. It was a piece specifically about Napoleon the most famous, important person in the world at that point. After the French Revolution in 1789, there was a reign of terror. 
and it wasn't clear what was going to happen in France, but Napoleon eventually rose to prominence with a series of victories and battles. The idea being to liberate Europe from all the wicked regimes which uh, were, were seen to be around at the time. And he sees Napoleon as liberating Europe and producing a sense of progress. And so Beethoven per perhaps sees himself as a kind of musical equivalent, trying to liberate music uh, from uh, old-fashioned styles and move forward. <laughs> What Beethoven relates to with Napoleon so much is the self-made man, the self-made hero, the person who made himself the most important person in the world by pulling himself up by his own bootstraps. Certainly for Beethoven, as a person who came from a small town and an alcoholic father, this is what one can accomplish when one is free. This is what freedom does when you can develop what you are born to be, what the capacities you're born to have. That's what Beethoven thought in terms of Napoleon, and it's certainly what he thought in terms of himself. And I think that conception is in one way and another all over his music, and it's all over for the rest of his life, really. And that's why his music at the time was considered to be a kind of a revelation of democracy among people. We are in the private living room of Count Lobkowitz, and Lobkowitz is one of the big patrons of Beethoven. We can imagine the doors open and in come some old noblemen with their families. They have heard there's a new symphony which has been written by the famous Beethoven. So Beethoven is here, he conducts the symphony, and you hear some sounds which never before have been heard. Roika is a new kind of a symphony. We have recorded the uh, Roika here, and when you sit here as one of the 100 audience, yeah, you feel the music just attack your body. Yeah, you just feel it's under your skin. We have to think about the halls and the acoustics where this music was done. The rooms were about 100 square meters. So if you put the 38 musicians there and play the Eroica, it's very loud music. It's like, it's comparable to when we go to a rock concert. It's, it's your body is moved by the sound. <laughs> wanted to have the same sound expression in, say, a modern concert hall like Berlin Philharmonics, you would need more than a thousand musicians to get the same impression. People are just totally disturbed by the fact how loud this music is. How the music wouldn't end, but also how harsh the attacks are, how dissonant the music is. One of the aristocrats that was listening to this first performance, he said, well, a Haydn symphony would be over by now. <laughs> I mean, it was just going on forever for them. If I wrote a symphony an hour long, it would be found short enough. If you fancy you can injure me, you are very much mistaken. They were fascinated by the extremes and by the bizarrery of his music. That's the word they use a lot. It's bizarre what he's doing, and they love it. The student, Reese, when he was writing a publisher to introduce it, simply said, I believe when this work is premiered, heaven and earth will tremble. 
Now, you didn't say things like that about a Haydn symphony <laughs> or even a Mozart symphony. You did not say heaven and earth were going to tremble. Napoleon has just proclaimed himself emperor. He'd seen Napoleon as liberating Europe from tyranny, and now he is going to become a tyrant himself. And so Beethoven is absolutely furious. So he too is nothing more than an ordinary man. Now he will also trample all human rights underfoot and only pander to his own ambition. He will place himself above everyone else and become a tyrant. According to Ferdinand Ries, Beethoven grabs the front page of his symphony, the autograph score, tears it in half from top to bottom. There was a manuscript copy, which was Beethoven was about to use for performance, and it says, Grand Symphony entitled Bonaparte, and Beethoven scores out the name of Napoleon so heavily that there's actually a hole in the paper. Any kind of tyranny Beethoven is strongly opposed to. Beethoven needs to mourn all of the idols, all of the heroes that he had put up on a pedestal. But of course, they're just human. You know, Beethoven starts to search for the spiritual hero, I think. Um, and maybe it's the hero that's within. The myth of Beethoven is that he was beyond subservience and he was too independent, did not need patrons and all that sort of thing, but in fact he depends on them very much. Beethoven is a freelancer, that means he has to piece together a living from composing and performing and teaching and patrons. And one of those patrons is Lichnowsky, who gives him a really very generous yearly stipend of 600 florins. It's great until Beethoven is visiting out in the country in, in Lichnowsky's palace and there are some French officers visiting who were occupying Vienna at the time, they're, they're Napoleon's soldiers, and Lichnowsky says, I want you to play for them, and Beethoven says, I will not play for our country's enemies. So Beethoven flees the palace after their argument, carrying the manuscript of the Appassionata, which got wet and smeared in the rainstorm. He gets home, he has a bust of Lichnowsky, he smashes it on the floor, and that's the end of Lichnowsky's stipend, which was about a third of his income, and that's what Beethoven was capable of then, but he never did that again with a patron. The legend says that after this episode, Beethoven goes to Lichnowsky and says, Prince, what you are, you are by birth. What I am, I made myself. There will be many thousands of princes. There is only one Beethoven. Did he actually say that? We don't really know. Could he have said that? Yes. Absolutely, and of course, he was right. <laughs> Some of these things that we think of now as just part of Beethoven's personality, the things that make him difficult to deal with on a personal level, are really products of his hearing loss. The dawning on Beethoven that he was no longer going to be able to conceal it was a soul-shattering experience for him. This is a letter that Stefan von Breuning, who had been living with Beethoven at the time, wrote in 1804 to Franz Wegler, who hadn't seen Beethoven in maybe half a dozen years. You would not believe, dear Wegler, what an indescribable and I should say truly dreadful impact the loss of his hearing has had on him. Imagine the feeling of being unhappy and with such a vehement nature as his. Add to this his shyness, 
distrust, often of his best friends, and general indecisiveness. In my situation, I find I spend a lot of time on my own because I need to clear things out. I need to just listen to myself because you can get bombarded with, with other things that affect other things that you do and therefore your mood. So you do become more isolated really, because you don't want to be in crowds, you don't want to be with other people. So I, I feel that everything is very targeted, almost. Anything that he does is for himself and his own exploration. I think with deafness, everything becomes focused. So if I speak with you, I'm speaking with you. I'm not also listening to something else or being distracted by something else. Yes, I may see other things, and that's part of my hearing world, but you are the most important thing in my life right now. Or if I'm striking this bass drum, this is the most important thing in my life. So that's the kind of focus that often you'll find with deaf people. Well, what we usually hear about Beethoven is that he was this bizarre type who was not very well communicating with society. So I do think that this is one of the many sources that gives us a, an idea of how, how much he actually was involved with the people around him. Beethoven very much enjoyed looking at women, lovely, youthful faces particularly pleased him. If we passed a girl who could boast her share of charms, he would turn around, look at her sharply through his glass, then laugh or grin when he realized I was watching him. He was very frequently in love, but usually only for a short time. It's fair to say that Beethoven always falls in love with the same type of woman. It means beautiful, young, aristocratic, and with a love for music. In the summer of 1804, Beethoven visits Charlotte von Brunswick in Hitzing. He knows the family von Brunswick since many years. At that occasion, he meets her sister Josephine again. She just lost her husband with pneumonia and she's pregnant with her fourth child. When they can't see each other, they exchange letters where um, the wording is very, very touching. I mean, both of them write that, I mean, Beethoven writes that Josefina is the only person that understands him and vice versa. Dear kind Beethoven, according to my promise, you're receiving a report from me on the first post day after my arrival. How are you? What are you doing? These questions occupy me rather often, very often. We know that there is this letter exchange between Josephine and, and, and Ludwig, and we know that they love each other, and this is, um, the myth rather ha has him alone. November 1804, by now, he's courting her in earnest. Courting her as a composer, he presents her with a song, An die Hoffnung, To Hope. Josephine's sisters, they like Beethoven as she does, but they think it's too dangerous for her not to be with him, but to marry him. There is a letter by Therese, by her sister, saying, she has had a dreadful nervous breakdown. Sometimes she laughed, sometimes wept, after which came utter fatigue and exhaustion. His relationship with Josephine is totally different to all the relationships he had with other women before. He really hopes she will help him to fulfill the mission of his life. 
long, long, of long duration may our love become, for it is so noble, so firmly founded upon mutual regard and friendship. Oh, you, you make me hope that your heart will long beat for me. Mine can only cease to beat for you when it no longer beats. Josephina's response to Beethoven is polite, but firm. You have long had my heart, dear Beethoven. If this assurance can give you joy, then receive it from the poorest heart. Do not tear my heart apart. Do not try to persuade me further. I love you inexpressibly, as one gentle soul does another. Are you not capable of this covenant? I am not receptive to other forms of love for the present. She knows that she won't be able to marry him because there is a question of she being a noble person and him being a bourgeois person that, that obviously is, it's allowed to be in contact with each other, but you're not allowed to marry. I mean, she would lose her noble connections with that. She would be a persona non grata if she did that. I'm convinced that they, that they loved each other, but they can't find a way to really l lead their life together. In 1805, she writes with an air of finality, I love you and value your moral character. You have shown much love and kindness to me and my children. I shall never forget that and as long as I live, I shall constantly take interest in your destiny and contribute what I can do to your success. In the autumn, she leaves Vienna for Budapest as the French army approaches. As a coda to the affair, Beethoven writes Josephine a final letter full of sadness. I thank you for wishing still to appear as if I were not altogether banished from your memory. You want me to tell you how I am? A more difficult question could not be put to me, and I prefer to leave it unanswered rather than to answer it too truthfully. It's really clear to me why Ludwig falls in love with these women that he can't really reach. He's lost his mother, the one woman that truly loved him. And he, in some ways, wants to bring her back. And he goes after these impossible women who socially and financially are out of his league. It's just not realistic. I mean, he could have found a woman. It's not so difficult to find somebody you can relate to and you can love and you can build a life with. Beethoven is apparently not able to relate to the real women that are around and that would be, that would be willing and, um, and uh, attractive enough to find his extremely giftedness and ex his ex extremeness in his personality attractive enough to fall in love with it. Now Ludwig is 35 years of age and he's still single, despite so many attempts at finding love and just sort of reeling from one catastrophic attempt to another. And if you look at how things have been throughout most of his, his life to date, it, he's kind of just repeating himself. But what is changing is his music because it's become, it's just growing and developing. And, you know, it seems that every time he finds himself back in this stage where he's single again and uh, lost the love of his life, he, he gives us another piece of glorious music. That part of him is maturing and, and not going wrong because that is the area that he truly does have control and where he brings joy, emotion and absolute fulfillment to anyone who plays or listens to his music. 
If we need an example of what Beethoven is capable of in his art, as distinct from the frequent wretchedness of his life, there's 1806. In 1806, he has just gone through the Josefina disappointment, which was terrible for him. He does a massive revision of Fidelio, which collapses because he has a fight with the manager. He has fevers that go on for months. He has an infected finger that nearly loses the finger. So his life is a shambles. And in that year, he writes the Fourth Symphony, he begins the Fifth Symphony, and he writes the Violin Concerto, and he writes the three Rasimovsky quartets that revolutionized that genre and set the course in some ways of string quartets for the next 50 years, and that is 1806. And every one of those are among the greatest examples of their genre. Razumovsky is the Russian ambassador in Vienna. He's a great enthusiast. He loves playing the violin. He plays Haydn string quartets. He's obsessed with Beethoven. He commissions him to write three quartets. He imagines at first himself as a player in these, in these works, but then when it becomes how clear how difficult the music is, he decides that he'll have a quartet in residence at his palace and he himself won't play, he will just employ the players. Beethoven was reflecting the extreme turbulence of the times with the Napoleonic Wars and Austria and Russia had recently had this horrible defeat at the Battle of Austerlitz at the hands of Napoleon. There were wounded uh, Austrian and Russian soldiers in the streets of Vienna. People perhaps expected their music to be a relief from those events, to be something more contained, more manageable. And instead Beethoven's reflecting humanity at its most complex and its most tragic. The emotion is also raw because of Beethoven's personal circumstances. I mean, it was only back in 1802 that he was suicidal about his deafness. He didn't want anyone to know about it. And then we see this very dramatic shift uh, out of which the middle period music comes. And particularly with this uh, 59 number three, he writes on a sketch leaf, um, let's your deafness no longer be a secret, not even in art. And it's a very defiant statement. You see the joy in the Razumovsky Quartet as something that is not easily won. It comes out of the suffering and it's, it's that much more powerful. can't sound easy, it needs to sound like it's joy achieved at a price. Forget about the music, about the human being. He is able to find some inner strength that maybe he didn't even know he had and hang on to that and look inward and go to, I think, a place in his soul that 
many of us never experience. From this despair, he becomes so incredibly prolific. It's almost as though the ideas are coming faster than he can write them down, faster, faster than he can digest them. And he changes the course of music. Everything changes because of Beethoven. This is a wonderful date, the 22nd of December, 1808, uh, two days before Christmas. And Beethoven wants to perform most of his new composed pieces. Beethoven composed so much music, symphonic music, in that uh, three, four years before 1808, that he had the feeling he has to present to the audience all what he has written or composed new. The, the concert starts with the Sixth Symphony, Pastorale. And is followed by um, um, a song, which is a perfido, and then some uh, excerpts uh, of uh, his new mess. And then uh, there was an intermission, and after the intermission, Beethoven performs himself uh, on the piano, uh, his um, fourth piano concerto. Uh, followed by, again, parts of his new mess. And then he performed the fifth symphony. The first some bars is so it's a very strong music and the people said, oh my God, that is not Baroque music any anymore. It starts with this famous few notes and the first movement is wild and dark and, and driven and passionate. Beethoven invented the journey from hell to paradise in his fifth symphony. Music shows that there is a possibility of coming out of tragedy and arrive to jubilation. By listening to the Fifth Symphony, if you are in trouble, you end up feeling good. It, it's, it's a medicine. It's a pill you have to swallow. And even had only one rehearsal for a four hours concert and therefore the quality of the concert was very very low. It was winter time in Vienna and they couldn't really heat the theater as much as it was needed and therefore the audience found it's too cold to listen to your concert. The people left and thought oh my god what was that uh, concert? I ran the theater 200 years later and I did exactly the program and for god's sake it was rehearsed Probably it was a high quality and my audience uh, not only gave a big, big, big applause after four hours, but have been very satisfied. That is the difference between 1808 and 2008. Beethoven stands between two uh, generations. Uh, with one foot, he is firmly grounded in the Mozart generation, who were the generation of the Enlightenment. Beethoven lived in the same period as Goethe lived, who was the, the prototype of Enlightenment. Beethoven, with his other part of his profile, was a member of the New Romantic Age, what is Romanticism? Romanticism is expression of feelings. And Beethoven was the person who actually moved music out of the Enlightenment into Romanticism.
Andreas Streicher, piano maker. He has a concert room in his factory and in this concert room he wants to have a lot of busts of famous musicians. And as he's a friend of Beethoven's, he, he asks, uh, shouldn't we make a bust of you? And uh, for the bust he needs a plaster mask of the face of Beethoven. From this mask they make this bust, so we know that from the proportions this is the face of Beethoven and this is very moving I think. Beethoven was a very life-loving guy, uh, somebody who made jokes with his friends, but when they produce the plaster mask they put it uh, straws in his nose so that he could breathe and everything else was plaster. And Beethoven is very angry when he gets the plaster on his face because it doesn't feel very good. This is why we have this, this grim expression, this dressed expression on, on his face. This bust will become very famous as an image of Beethoven. And this is why we always think Beethoven is the grim Titanic guy. What underlies his creation is love towards humanity, maybe not towards particular people. We know that he could be very angry at certain people, but a love towards humanity in general. And this is something which lends most of his music this uplifting quality. Beethoven writes the Fifth Piano Concerto in 1809 while Vienna is being bombarded by French artillery. Beethoven is horrified. He sees nothing but misery and squalor on the streets, which he writes about to his friends. Since May 4th, I have produced very little coherent work, at most a fragment here and there. The whole course of events has affected my body and soul. What a disturbing, wild life around me. Nothing but drums, cannons, men, misery of all sorts. He's hiding in a basement during the bombardments, trying desperately to protect the last vestiges of his hearing from, from impact of the shells falling. And during this time, he writes what would become one on, of his best known pieces, uh, one which shows great resilience of spirit. Uh, it is music which is entirely uplifting. It is music which is so energetic. <laughs> I think this is one of the reasons why his music finds such universal appeal and, and love because people from all around the world can relate to this basic feeling of hope and not just hope but certainty in a much better future. Beethoven can express emotions in music in a way that you can never quite do it in words. One of Beethoven's pupils is Dorothea Altman, who's a very fine pianist indeed, one of the best pianists at the time. And she has a child who unfortunately dies at the age of only three. According to Dorothea's recollections, Beethoven comes and visits her, and he just sits down at the piano and plays to her without saying a word.
he just improvises, extemporizes, plays for goodness knows how long. He just played and then just left without saying a word. That was his consolation, his way of comforting her. And apparently she was moved very strongly and um, is very grateful to him. Who could describe this music? One thought they heard choirs of angels which celebrated the entry of my poor child into the world of light. Then, as he finished, he pressed my hand with a heavy heart and left just as silently as he had come. Beethoven is a person that is capable to engage with people around him. He is alert to their feelings, That who is empathetic, who listens, who tries to compose his music in a way so that it's meaningful to the people around him. People so often say, I, words fail me on this occasion. And Beethoven probably felt the same. Words fail you on when, when you're trying to comfort someone who's just lost a, a child or a father. And so by playing music, that sort of comforts in a, in a way that words can't. And so he gets the sort of emotion in the music in a way that one can never quite do the same with words. So he's actually inspiring her in that way. Beethoven decides to go to the spas in Bohemia in order to recover from feeling unwell. And it's a terrible journey. It's been pouring with rain. The road is virtually bottomless. It's sort of sunk in mud and the coach drivers managed to get the coach through. And so while he's still in bed, he writes this letter to what, the woman who's now known as the Immortal Beloved. My angel, my all, myself. Only a few words today. In fact, with pencil, with yours. Can our love exist but by sacrifices? By not demanding everything? Can you change it? That you are not completely mine, I am not completely yours. Oh God, look upon beautiful nature and calm yourself over what must be. It's 1812, Beethoven is now 41 years of age and all attempts at a relationship have been a disaster. He's been in and out of love for as long as we can remember. And he has written this incredible, beautiful love letter to somebody that has played into his myth. While still in bed, my thoughts surge towards you my immortal beloved, now joyfully, then again sorrowfully, waiting to know whether fate will hear us. I must live with you entirely, or not at all. You can see the ending of that letter here on the page is almost ecstatic in the writing. It's, it's, it's flailing around and, and almost out of control on the page as his feelings are almost out of control. Be calm. Love me. Today, yesterday, what a tearful desire to be with you. You, my life, my all. Farewell. Oh, never cease to love me. Never misguide the most faithful heart of your beloved. Eternally yours. Eternally mine. Eternally ours, L. The point of this letter seems to be that 
they can't be together now. Between the lines, there's a certain suspicion, a certain intimation that maybe they never can be together. It's so touching in his wording. It's really a love letter in the best sense. But at the same time, it's so mysterious. I mean, we don't, we still don't really know who the woman was. The candidates are Amelie Brentano. She was an unhappily married woman to a businessman who was a friend of Beethoven's. Were they carrying on a backstairs romance? That doesn't seem very likely. Another is Bettina Brentano, who had wanted to be a muse to genius, but she was about to be married to a poet. Josefina Dame, who he had written letters to, but as far as we know, he hadn't seen her for years and she was nowhere in the vicinity. This is a very interesting piece of writing. He imagines a situation with somebody he loves in a very vivid way. In the letter itself, he puts in a movie scene an image of how he wants to be with a woman and how he wants to be as a person. He's giving his inner feelings an immediate, not very formed expression. He imagines himself as being in the place where he always wanted to be. Beethoven is apparently not able to relate to the real women that are around. There have been women who fell in love with this special, you know, crazy man, but what a craziness. <laughs> But he couldn't, he couldn't work it out because he had, a, again, I think because he had such an overflated idea of himself that he couldn't make the step from the ideal worked out, I want to be this, to the not so ideal, but I can have that. The wording of this love letter to the immortal beloved is very near to the earlier letters Beethoven exchanged with Josefine. I actually think due to the work of especially fe female researchers, um, we by now can be 90% sure that Josefine is the immortal beloved. There's no postal marks or anything on it, which makes me think it almost certainly wasn't sent. I'm pretty sure that Beethoven, having written the letter, felt that, that was the almost the end of the story. He declared his love in the letter. He was going to keep that as a sort of permanent memento of the woman, permanent record of his love. His love was all poured out into the letter. And in the same way, the Heiligenstadt Testament was a kind of ceremonial burial of his emotional feelings over his deafness, his, his suffering and grief. Here is a ceremonial burial of his love for the woman. I wonder if this is a wake-up moment for him, a moment of realisation. He's in some way resigned to the fact that if he can't have her, that's it. He's put everything into it. He cannot find another ounce of himself. He doesn't feel he's worth it anymore. In 1812, two weeks after the Immortal Beloved letter, he gets a letter from a young girl who's a piano player. She sends him a wallet that she made herself. Your wallet will be treasured, among other tokens of regard, which several people have expressed for me, but which I'm still far from deserving. Do not rob Handel, Haydn, and Mozart of their laurel wreaths. They are entitled to theirs, but I am not yet entitled to one. Is his humility false there? Not exactly. But again, he's really, he's depressed. And he's being kind as he could be. But he's also being honest and, and saying something that I think any honest artist says. I, I'm, not, I'm not where I thought I would be. I'm not where I want to be. I have a sense that I haven't reached what I've been reaching for. I think every honest artist feels that, and this is the one, one of the few times when Beethoven is ready to say that to a young girl. 
Only art and science can raise men to the level of gods. The true artist has no pride. He sees, unfortunately, that art has no limits. He has a vague awareness of how far he is from reaching his goal. The aftermath of the immortal beloved affair you see play out over the next couple of years of his life. He's in a bad state, perhaps drinking heavily. A friend who visits him in this period says, I will refrain from describing the state he was in. And he begins keeping a diary in this period. And this is one of the entries in the diary. Oh, terrible circumstances which do not suppress my longing for domesticity, but prevent its realization. Oh God, God, look down upon the unhappy Beethoven. Do not let it continue like this any longer. When the implications of all this settled in, that he was not going to have the love that he had always wanted, he was not going to have the family that he always wanted, he was going to have to live for himself and his art only. You must not be human, not for yourself, only for others. For you, there can be no more happiness, except within yourself, in your art. Oh God, give me the strength to conquer myself. Nothing must bind me to this life. All is ruined. You have to be lonely in order to be an all-embracing great personality like Beethoven was. If you're not lonely, if you have a partner, a, a wife, a husband, a friend, um, it's, it's a little more difficult because your energy is focused on one or a few people. If you are completely lonely, then something opens up in you and you can embrace the whole world. So I think Beethoven has this painful love in him that he is alone, he's deaf, the world is shut out, so he feels love for the whole world and he can express that. As soon as I approach Beethoven, suddenly it's almost as though you're being hurtled into somebody's innermost pain and innermost love and joy and all at the same time. He's trapped in this world inside his own head because he doesn't hear what's going on mostly around him. And then he gives us the Seventh Symphony. <laughs> What do you do if, you're, if you've got something blocking your ears? You ask somebody to speak louder to you because you can't hear them. If they're going to hear his music, they're going to hear his music. He's crying out his pain as well because his most excruciating chords and dissonances are the moments of the most volume. Is a composer allowed to be wild? And Beethoven said, yes, I am. If you like it or not, I'm wild. And my music is wild. <laughs> The Seventh Symphony picks up an idea which seems to be fashionable, the repetitive rhythm, a certain rhythmic pattern, and this goes on and on and on if it's deep. And 
in no other composition is it as extreme as in the Seventh Symphony, which is like an orgy of this rhythmic pattern. It goes on and on and on in a, in a completely and almost boringly repetitive way. I mean, Mozart would have probably must have hated it would he be alive but for the time this was the new great idea it is a drug it excites us and this excitement is something the new composer wants what the old old people thought it was dangerous or devilish now Beethoven wants to excite us with this repeated, repeated rhythm. And this is the Seventh Symphony's power. There may be people who have great taste and say, come on, Beethoven, this is, this is impossible. How can you write about 700 times the same rhythmic pattern? And then he says, this is exactly what I do, and it will excite people, and they will love it. I think it's the beginning of this incredibly rich internal imaginative life so that he starts hearing in ways that we can't imagine. Forget the world, okay, I can't hear that. Now I'm gonna hear music from heaven. I'm gonna hear music from hell. I'm gonna hear music that no one else can hear. And then he shares that with us. And this is the revolution for me. <laughs> <laughs> 